Now, before you say, oh, I'm so depressed, I must be highly intelligent human being, I'm afraid to say to you that this is not exactly how science works. But new scientific evidence might shed a light on something we wondered for a really long time. Are highly intelligent people more susceptible to mental disorders? We will need to discuss new scientific findings and look at famously successful and gifted people from their past and their work. We will need to define intelligence in the first place and ask ourselves what does it mean for future of our civilization? Will smart people always be cursed? Because this is Fabric of Life, a show where we try to connect art and science to answer humanity's most complicated questions. And we take everything from modern architecture to ancient historical findings, from great literature to cutting edge statistics. My name is Vladislav Radek, I'm writer and mathematician. And today's question is really complicated one. Why are highly intelligent people more susceptible to mental disorders? Let me take you on an adventure. There are a lot of advantages of being smart. People who do well on standardized tests of intelligence or IQ tests as we call them tend to do better in school and the workplace. For reasons that we are still not able to understand, they tend to live longer and healthier lives and they tend to experience less life shocks like for example bankruptcy. But this is not why we are here today. We are here to talk about downsides of being intelligent. And before we continue further, I want to uh, share with you some research uh, that I did of wildly successful individuals from the past and their potential mental disorders. Now, I want you to take this with a pinch of salt because obviously it's like really hard to um, diagnose people from the past who are already dead and also this list is widely speculative and highly susceptible to our modern interpretation and biases. But anyway, I was thinking this list is quite interesting, so here we go. First on this list, Ludwig van Beethoven, bipolar disorder. Beethoven's fits of mania were well known in his circle of friends, and when he was not high, he could not compose numerous works at once. It was during his down periods that many of his most celebrated works were written. Sadly, this was also when he contemplated suicide, as he told his brothers in letters to his life. During the early part of 1813, he went through such a depressive period that he stopped caring about his appearance and he would fly into rages during dinner parties. Well, this definitely sounds like bipolar disorder and Ludwig van Beethoven being completely nuts at some parties. The next on the list, Edvard Munch. Famous Norwegian painter had apparently panic attacks. One of his panic attacks occurred in Oslo during January of 1892. Munch recorded the episode in his diary. One evening I was walking along the path, the city was on the side and fjord below. I felt tired and ill and I stopped and looked out over the fjord. The sun was setting and the clouds turning blood red. I sensed a scream passing through nature. When it comes to painters, Michelangelo apparently was suffering from autism. According to paper published in Journal of Medical Biography in 2004, Michelangelo's single-minded routine may have been due to disorder of autism. According to descriptions by his contemporaries, the painter was preoccupied with his own reality. Most of the male members of his family are also recorded to have exhibited similar symptoms. Michelangelo also seemed to have had difficulty forming relationships with people. He had few friends and didn't even attend his brother's funeral. Charles Dickens? Depression. By his 30s, Dickens was the most famous author in the world. He was wealthy and seemed to have it all. But after an unbelievably difficult childhood, which saw the author working in a boot factory and living on his own when his father was thrown in prison, Dickens would start falling into depressions with the start of each novel. Hmm, this sounds 
familiar, the first one to cause him problems was one of his less known works, The Chimes, in 1844. After that, Dickens' friends wrote that he became down every time he set to work on a new project and that his mood would gradually lift until it was kind of mania by the time he finished. His depression worsened with age and he eventually separated from his wife, the mother of his 10 children, to live with 18-year-old actress. Oh my god, Dickens was maybe a Dickens! and also highly depressed. And this list goes on and on. If you think you're interested, we covered Ernest Hemingway, Pablo Picasso and Antonio Vivaldi in separate episodes and they are like so interesting. And if you think that your boyfriend should see a therapist, you should definitely check those documentaries. I'm going to link them down below. But all those things are kind of rumors from the past. But what we can tell about our present and, of course, our future? Well, luckily this is where science comes to the rescue. In a study just published in Journal Intelligence, Pitzer College researcher Ruhr Kapinski and her colleagues emailed a survey with questions about psychological and psychological disorders to members of Mensa. A high IQ society Mensa requires that its members have an IQ in the top 2%. Most intelligent test corresponds to an IQ about 132 or higher. For your reference, the average IQ of the general population is around 100. The survey of Mensa's highly intelligent members found that they were more likely to suffer from a range of serious disorders. Now, we were not going to get into nitty-gritty of does intelligence really exist and how we can measure it and do IQ tests can actually tell if somebody is intelligent or not. And also, obviously, if you're not part of the Mensa, that does not necessarily mean that you're not intelligent. So this scientific finding is far from perfect and their sample is also not ideal. But anyhow, this is what they found out. The biggest differences between the Mensa group and the general population were seen for mood disorders and anxiety disorders. More than a quarter of the sample reported that they have been formally diagnosed with mood disorder, while 20% reported an anxiety disorder far higher than the national averages around 10% for each. The differences were smaller but still statistically significant and practically meaningful for most of the other disorders. The prevalence of environmental allergies was triple than the national average. 33% versus 11%. To explain their findings, Karpinski and her colleagues proposed something that they call hyperbrain, hyperbody theory. This theory holds that for all its advantages, being highly intelligent is associated with its psychological and physiological overexcitabilities, or OEs, a concept introduced by Polish psychiatrist and psychologist Kazimierz Zdabrowski in the 1960s. An OE is an unusually intense reaction to environmental threat or insult. This can include anything from a startling sound to confrontation with another person. Psychological OEs include a heightened tendency to ruminate and worry, whereas physiological OEs arise from body's response to stress. According to hyperbrain hyperbody theory, those two types of OEs are most common in the highly intelligent people and interact with each other in a vicious circle to cause both psychological and physiological dysfunction. For example, one might receive an email from the boss and highly intelligent, well-read and kind of over-educated person will try to figure out what that email really means and try to plot out all different outcomes and sometimes overthink what can happen next and maybe even spend the sleepless night triggering body's stress response. On the other side, uh, let's say less intelligent person would just read that email for what it is and not worry too much about it and just continue on with his or her life.
We need to be very cautious when interpreting those results because they are correlational, showing that the disorder is more common in a sample of people with high IQs than a general population does not prove that higher intelligence is cause of the disorder. It's also possible that people who join Mensa differ from other people in ways other than just IQ. For example, people preoccupied with intellectual pursuits may spend less time than average person on physical exercise and social interaction both of which have been shown to have broad benefits for psychological and physical health. The researchers pointed out highly intelligent people have tendencies for intellectual over-excitabilities and hyperreactivity of the central nervous system. On the other hand, that gives people with higher IQ heightened awareness of their surroundings, helping their artistic and creative work. In fact, the field of cognitive ability recognizes one aspect of highly intelligent people to be deeper and broader in comprehending their surroundings. This hyperreactivity, however, can also lead to deeper depression and poor mental health. This turns out to particularly be true for poets, novelists and people with high verbal intelligence. Their intense emotional response to the environment increases tendencies for self-reflection and worry both which predict depression and anxiety disorder. There is no easy and light way to finish this episode. There is still a lot we don't know about the connection between intelligence and mental diseases. Until science gives us more answers, we can only respect even more the great achievements and works of art for which their creators paid the full price after sacrificing their sanity in search for the deeper meaning. And as Hemingway smartly pointed out, Happiness in intelligent people is the rarest thing I know. Hey, if you like this episode, don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Every week I'm taking you on new and amazing adventures. And in the meantime, you can check out our documentaries about Leonardo da Vinci, Picasso and Hemingway. Until then, stay tuned and curious and don't forget, libraries still exist.